Siracusa then can in every way be considered the beginning of history here in Sicily. I say the beginning of history, but of course Sicily has also a vast prehistory. But we'll talk about Sicily's prehistory in another of our videos. Today, let's just concentrate on history. The Greeks arrived in Siracusa in 713 BC. It wasn't actually the very first Greek colony here in Sicily. That was in Naxos, a little bit further up the coast near towards Taormina. But nevertheless, that was only a year or so prior to the Greeks arriving here in Siracusa. And the Greeks established themselves here on the island of Ortigia, which is just 20 or 30 metres from the rest of Sicily. So why did they choose to settle themselves here on Ortigia? Well, there's several answers to that question. Firstly, being an island, it was easily defensible. The Greeks tended to like settling on the end of a promontory or an island close to the mainland. But also here, on the other side of the island, is what is known as the Grand Harbour, a vast protected area of sea where the Greeks would have been able to leave their boats and their ships. Within 200 years, Syracuse had become one of the largest, the most powerful and the most influential cities in the Mediterranean. It had long burst out from the island of Ortigia and in fact there were four other suburbs to Syracuse, Taiki, Akradine, Neapolis and Epipole. Epipole being up on the hills above the city. Just to give you some idea of the population of Syracuse in those days, we of course don't have exact figures, but we estimate that the population of Syracuse in the 5th century BC was something like 200,000 people. Of course, it's impossible to know exactly, and furthermore, the Greek household was composed not only of the family but also of the servants and added to which there were also the local people living in the environs around Syracuse. But nevertheless we can get some idea by looking at the size of the Greek theatre here in Syracuse which holds around 20,000 people. Remember that it was an obligation for Greek citizens to attend the theatre and therefore looking at the size of the theatre we can calculate or estimate the size of the population. And we estimate the population to have been something like 200,000 people. Now contrast that with the population of Syracuse today which is something like 120,000. In other words, two and a half thousand years ago the size of Syracuse was almost twice as big as it is today. It's true to say that the Greek colonies here in Sicily were not the very first colonies abroad. Those were the ones further up the Italian peninsula uh, towards Naples, but also some of the colonies in Calabria predate the Greek colonies in Sicily. Why then did the Greeks come to Sicily? It's a very good question and we don't have a certain answer to it. One suggestion is that they were following the example of the Carthaginians who were already moving around the Mediterranean. But the other idea, and I think this is very probable, is that the Greek system of inheritance favoured the eldest child in the family and therefore the younger children missed out and if they were to find land or wealth they had to emigrate and to go elsewhere. So what were the Greeks looking for here in Sicily? Well, probably not mineral deposits. There were mineral deposits in Calabria and the southern Italian peninsula, but not really so much here in Sicily. Probably it was the fertile land round about. The 
iron rich soils of the land around Tassilacusa yielded huge crops of wheat and grains and also fruits and not forgetting of course vines and olives. We often forget what the Greek diet would have been like but in fact it was probably a very simple diet. The Greeks would not have eaten meat very often, possibly only once or twice a month. Otherwise it consisted of course of olive oil and cheeses and then uh, breads and so forth made of the various grains but also it was very rich in fruits. So what were the fruits that the Greeks would have eaten? Figs certainly, apples, pears and of course not forgetting grapes. But they wouldn't have known oranges and lemons. They weren't brought to Sicily until much later by the Arabs. Nor would they have known things like tomatoes which of course weren't brought to the Europe at all until they were introduced by the Spanish from the New World in the 16th century. The very first settlers here in Syracuse came from Corinth. Now although they hadn't maintained for example a trading link with their mother city they did nevertheless maintain a very strong emotional link. And so it was then during the Peloponnesian War which was fought between the city-states of Athens and Sparta that Athens decided to send a fleet against Syracuse. Why was that? Well because the mother city of Syracuse which was Corinth was aligned with Athens arch enemy Sparta. Behind me is the great harbour of Syracuse and it was here that was fought one of the great naval battles of ancient history. In 415 BC, Athens sent a fleet of 130 triremes to blockade the city of Syracuse. And they blockaded it for two years. And then in September 413 BC, there was an auspicious event for the Syracusans. There was an eclipse of the moon. And the Syracusans saw this as a sign that they could attack the Athenian fleet and defeat them. So one night in September 413 BC, they blockaded, they raided the fleet of the Athenians and 130 triremes were sunk in this harbour. The sailors of the Athenian fleet and the soldiers that were on board took flight into the hills behind the harbour here. Many of them were caught down and brought as captives back to the city of Syracuse where they spent the rest of their days in captivity, in labour, working in the quarries. Who then was here before the Greeks arrived? Well the native population were a people that we call the Sickles. Now we'll talk more about them in another programme but suffice to say for the moment that they were the ones who of course gave their name to the island of Sicilia or what we know as Sicily. What happened then to these native sickles with the arrival of the Greeks? Well there are various conflicting accounts of this. Um, by some accounts they were driven off up into the hills by other accounts they were made into slaves but yet other people contend that the relationship between the native sickle population and the Greeks was actually a very symbiotic one. What then happened to the buildings that the Greeks made here on the island of Ortigia? Well some of the buildings would have been made of wood that's for sure to say and that uh, has long since disappeared. Some of them were reused, they were recycled. A good example of that is the Temple of Athena which is nowadays the Duomo or the Cathedral of Syracuse. But the other thing that happened was that during the 16th century of course the great threat to the island of Sicily, remember at that time it was still under the rule of the Spanish, but the great threat was from 
the Ottomans from the Turks. And up until the Battle of Lepanto, when the Turkish fleet was defeated in 1571, that threat remained. So throughout the 16th century, the Spanish decided to fortify the island of Ortigia, and it was they who built these battlements around it. Where did they get the stone from? Well, unfortunately, they reused the stone from the Greek temples. I'm standing here in the main square of Syracuse, in front of surely one of the most iconic buildings in the whole of the island of Sicily. This is the Cathedral of Syracuse. It is quite probably the oldest building used for Christian worship today, because this was not just built as a cathedral. It was built at the beginning of the 5th century BC in 1485 by the Greeks as the Temple of Athena to commemorate the victory over the Carthaginians at the Battle of Himera. The Temple of Athena was one of the wonders of the ancient world. Today, when we look at the cathedral, the entrance is on this side, just behind me, facing west. But the entrance to the temple was on the easternmost side, on the seaward facing side. And above the entrance was a huge gold disc, which reflected the light of the sun. And it was known to all the sailors of the ancient world. The temple became a church in Byzantine times, and then subsequently a mosque under the Arabs. And then it was reconverted into a church under the rule of the Normans in the 11th century. And it was at that time the Normans put on a facade. But the facade of the Norman church was completely destroyed in the 1693 earthquake. And it was in the middle of the 18th century that a, an architect by the name of Andrea Palma from Palermo designed the facade that we see today built, of course, in the Baroque style. If you look carefully there on the right-hand side of the facade of the cathedral is the statue of Saint Lucy. She's identified by holding a cup with two eyes in it, for which there's something of a gruesome story. The story goes that Lucy was living here in Syracuse in the 4th century AD, and her mother was ill. As a Christian, therefore, Lucy went to the city of Cadania to pray for her mother at the tomb of another Christian saint, St Agatha. On her return to Syracuse, her husband renounced her to the Roman authorities as a Christian, and she was arrested. However, when the Roman soldiers came to take her away, they found that a miracle had occurred and her body had become so heavy that they couldn't physically drag it away. They built a pyre beneath it and they tried to set fire to it and to burn her. But even so, her body wouldn't burn. And so in the end, losing patience, one of the Roman soldiers took out his sword and slit her throat. Lucy was buried here in the catacombs of the city and a short while later she was made a saint. But that wasn't the end of her story because subsequently Syracuse was overrun by the Goths and the Visigoths and then in turn it was attacked by a Byzantine army arriving from Constantinople and it was the Byzantine general Belisarius who rescued the bones of Lucy and he took them to Constantinople for safe keeping where they were buried in the Hagia Sophia. But the story is still not complete 
because it was during the sacking of Constantinople in the Fourth Crusade, at the beginning of the 13th century, that a Venetian by the name of Dandolo found the bones, which he presumed to be those of Lucy, and he took them to Venice. And so the bones of St Lucy today reside in Venice, and that's why the Venetians claim St Lucy as their own. Lucy, in Italian, is Lucia. It's closely related to the word luce, which means light. And that's why St Lucy is the patron saint of light. Her saint's day is the 13th of December, which of course falls at one of the very darkest times of the year. That's why she's especially celebrated in countries like Sweden, where of course at that time of the year it is completely pitch black. Lucy, therefore, is seen as the saint that brings light to these people. One of the things that the visitors to Siracusa very often fail to appreciate is that underneath this pavement here is a whole network of tunnels. These were originally built in Roman times as catacombs to bury the city's dead. Then subsequently more catacombs were built on the far side of the city and those tended to overcome the use of the ones here. But nevertheless, the tunnels underneath Ortigia remained. And during the Second World War, they were used as air raid shelters by the inhabitants of the city. And indeed, there's even a tunnel that goes out into the Grand Harbour and if necessary, the inhabitants could have escaped. Behind me is the remains of the Temple of Apollo, which was one of the first temples to be built by the Greeks here in Ortigia. And it's actually one of the earliest Greek temples that we have the remains of here in Sicily. However, as you can see, all that we really have left of it is the stilobate, or in other words, the base of the temple, and two or three of the Doric columns and a little part of the inner kella, which was the inner room of the temple. What's unusual about this temple and what makes it different from all the other Greek temples that we have in Sicily is that the columns are monolithic, meaning that they are cut from a single piece of stone. One of the extraordinary things about this temple was that it was actually only discovered in the 19th century. So how on earth did that come about? Well, like a lot of these Greek temples, they were reused and recycled in other buildings. And this particular one became a garrison building for the Bourbon troops. And it was only after that the Bourbons were kicked out in the middle of the 19th century and their garrison that was torn down, that they discovered that underneath it all was a Greek temple. How do we know then that it was dedicated to Apollo? Well, that's a very good question, because the dedicatee of the temple was very often a statue that would be kept inside the keller, inside this um, wall, inside the temple. But of course, in the case of this temple, no statue has ever been found. And therefore, archaeologists were always very unsure as to who the dedicatee of the temple was. But if you look very carefully at the steps of the stilobate down there, you can see that there is an inscription in Greek. And it's this inscription that tells us the temple was dedicated to the god Apollo. And this here is the fountain of Arethusa. There's a legend that the river nymph Arethusa was bathing in a river in the Peloponnese in Greece when she was pursued by Alpheus. She dived into the river, swam underwater, kept on swimming until she came up here in Ortigia in Sicily. And hence, this fountain is named after her. So the Greeks believed that this fountain was somehow connected by an underground waterway to the Peloponnese. Of course it's not true, but it's a nice legend all the same.
The other story that we can relate to this is that Nelson, before the Battle of the Nile, he had his fleet in the harbour here. And in his diaries, Nelson said that he watered his fleet at the fountain of Arethusa. That can't actually be true because this water is very slightly saline. It used to be fresh water, but when the Spanish built the protective city walls back in the 16th century, they broke the water table and the seawater has now got into the fountain. This here is the market of Ortigia. Let's go and have a look. And these here are Sicilian lemons from nearby to Siracusa. Local broccoli, just one euro fifty for each bunch. And now is the season for fresh beans. At the end of the summer, we start to get the finocchio. Finocchio, fennel, as we call it in English, is actually a winter vegetable in Sicily. I know in England we tend to eat it during the summer, uh, but here it makes a beautiful salad in the winter with oranges. And look at these beautiful red onions. These are not from Sicily, these are from Tropea. Tropea is in Calabria. And look at all that wonderful basil. I can see some fantastic salads being made there. This here is the uh, Fratelli Burgio, which is where we often come to have our lunch. And look at these wonderful Sicilian fish. Many of these, I have to admit, I have no idea what we call in English. These ones here are little red mullets. These are little mackerels. These ones in Sicilian, we call them ope, but I don't know what they are in, uh, in English. These ones here, though, are little baby cods. And then we have some local prawns. Best of all are the local anchovies. These are split in two, bones removed, and you can even eat these raw. Here we've got some larger cods. Uh, these ones here are sarge. Some more uh, sea breams here. These are a mixture of sea bream and sea bass. These ones, I don't know what they are actually in English. I'd call them zebra fish. And these fish here are very special. They are local fish. In Sicilian, we call them either lampuga or capone. Capone because if you look carefully, they have a very large head. And they are local fish at this time of the year. Here we have some of the local prickly pears. These here are called in Sicilian teneruni, and they are the tendrils of the courgette plant. Um, but we cook them up and we make a very delicious soup with them. Most places you'd just throw them away, but here everything is used. And of course many, many different types of tomatoes. The cherry tomatoes, these slightly greener tomatoes for making uh, a salad. Those who like, like the uh, Piccadilly or the Datterino tomatoes. And then the larger tomatoes, these are very often used for, for cooking. And the quintessential Sicilian ingredient is wild fennel. This is not the fennel bulbs that we saw earlier. This is the, um, the feathery tendrils of the fennel which is used to flavour much of the cooking and especially of course fish. We mustn't forget the wonderful aubergines that they grow in Sicily and they have multiple different types of aubergine and the beautiful red peppers. These are the local fruits. These are peaches. Notice their slightly flat shape. And some local pears. Look, they're smaller than many of the pears that we would know in, for example, in England. Apricots, and this time of year we start to get pomegranates as well. These here are a local type of plum, 
And we mustn't forget, of course, the grapes, both the green grapes and the, um, in Sicilian, we call them the black grapes rather than the red grapes. Nectarines and various different qualities of peaches and finally apples. Apples are not really a Sicilian fruit. They tend to come from the north of Italy. And the numerous different types of onions that we have. These here are white onions and then red onions, of course, as well. Behind me is our favorite hotel here in Ortigia, the Hotel Gutkowski. This was the original building but about 10, 15 years ago, they bought another one, almost adjacent, where many of us stay these days. It's only a small hotel, but it's by far the friendliest of all the hotels in Ortigia. One of the things that you soon learn about choosing a hotel in Sicily, it's got nothing to do with the size of the hotel or the stars on TripAdvisor. It's to do with the staff that work there. And that's why we always decide to stay here. This behind me here is the second building of the Gutkowski. You see it has windows that face out onto the sea and a beautiful terrace bar where you can sit and have drinks or your meal in the evening. 